Welcome back to the next session, and my name is Li Jing. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Urban Engineering at NYU Tandem. And uh, uh, I'm the moderator of the session on how to accelerate the safe and secure deployment of CUVs in smart cities. And we have four presentations in this session. Each one will be 15 minutes plus a uh, uh, like two or three minutes uh, Q&A session. And our, uh, our first presentation is by uh, Joa Sapphire from uh, Exo plus GDG at the uh, University at uh, 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 Buffalo. Uh, and the presentation is on Buffalo principle for uh, sustainable real-world deployment of a ton of Let's welcome uh, <laughs> Good morning. Um, good morning. So uh, it's a pleasure to speak to all of you to, uh, today, and. Um, I, uh, let's see if we go, okay. So, um, so today I'm gonna talk about sustainable real world deployment of automated vehicles. And this actually is uh, the fourth time I'm part of the Connected Automated Vehicle Symposium. Um, I presented in the third and fourth um, symposium in Albany, uh, and then the fifth symposium in New York City. So it's a great uh, to see everyone again. And the, you know, the fantastic thing about this, uh, this platform is the opportunity for industry, uh, university, and government to collaborate together. And I think that's really one of the keys to, uh, to having success in this space, because it's an interdisciplinary challenge um, with new technology and actually deploying in the real world whether recognizing um, profit potential or helping to support better services. And uh, I, I don't think he's in the audience, but I definitely want to commend uh, Dr. Khan Osby, who, uh, who, is, who helped to start this um, with the first Connected Vehicle Symposium, and it's great that it's continuing here at NYU. And my background actually supports or exemplifies this um, uh, need for Inter, uh, for interdisciplinary collaboration. I started my career as a research scientist, uh, then went into government and, um, and helped to write policy and, and manage uh, billion dollar budgets directly, uh, and now have a chance to work as an investor. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, drawing on those experiences, um, have decided to go back to academia, uh, and I have an appointment at Columbia, uh, an appointment at University of Buffalo, um, and it's great to bring all those lessons and knowledge um, from technical science uh, to government policy to investing to help to try and solve these problems. And I think that's why we've had some of the successes. Uh, and actually, uh, two of my former students are in the audience, uh, Jordan Reiser and uh, Ray New Grover. Um, and you know, in our class, uh, we talk about infrastructure investing. Um, and you know that's a key component in, in what we need for automated vehicles is digital infrastructure. Um, and so if you want to um, talk to Jordan or Randy for some new ideas um, on investing and, and supporting that in terms of infrastructure and public transit, I'm sure they'd be happy to talk to you. Um, so I'm glad they're here. Um, so, so that's sort of the background in the big picture. And then one other introductory uh, comment I'd like to offer is, you know, we talk about disruption. Um, and, uh, and, and, and recognize that that's um, a, a great talking point and attractive um, in the media. Um, but I don't know if that really applies to what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, I think more of progress. And, um, and I think that, that what we feel, I think, together is the lack of progress in this area. We want to see automated vehicles deployed. We want to see improvements in safety. We want to see congestion solved. We want to see new jobs and technology offered. Um, and, uh, and it's been very difficult to accomplish. 
And so I think that this forum, as an inter as a way to collaborate together, maybe will help us to get there. Um, and let's see if I can convince you that, that maybe we've made some progress. So, um, actually building on Evangelos' um, comments, just big picture, global motor vehicle market. Um, you know, the traditional model just on motor vehicles is 80 million in sales, um, average of $19,000. Uh, That's a $1.5 trillion global market, um, just on the OEM piece. And, uh, and that represents 2% of global GDP. And then everyone is focused on shared mobility, um, transportation network companies. If we do a similar math and look at actually uh, monetizing the miles traveled by vehicles, that would then generate a market of 10 trillion globally, um, which is 13% of global GDP. So this is a theoretical um, analysis and it increases the global market um, by 6.7 times. But now, um, with the valuation of Uber and the expected IPO next year, we're actually beginning to get actual real market prices. So Uber is valued at 120 billion, um, which is roughly four times the valuation of GM. Um, or um, or, e e or even, even greater the valuation of Ford. Um, and, uh, and so um, the issue of sustainability, the, the issue of um, long-term profitability um, is, is a major question. But I think that what the market is saying in terms of the financial market is that there is value in this new paradigm. Um, and how we, how we um, achieve that value is really the challenge for all of us. Um, but, um, but if we have this market pull, Right? If there's opportunities in the market where investors um, um, will invest in this space, how come we haven't seen um, more progress? Right? Um, how come I couldn't take um, an automated vehicle, any type of automated vehicle um, offered by the MTA to this venue? Um, really, um, we see sort of two major things. Uh, and this is sort of the interdisciplinary work that needs to happen is we talk about overlapping government. And, and again, how would we quantify that? Uh, we know that government is doing a lot of work in this area, but if we just look at it in a very uh, simple way in terms of who owns the roadways, we know that federal roadways are about 150,000 miles, state 780,000, county 1.8 million, um, cities and towns, 1.3 million. Um, authority, um, 57,000. So from a U.S. perspective, the total centerline miles is 4 million miles. And, and when we also talk about um, the idea of smart cities, you know, which one of these entities is the smart city, right? Because if we really want shared mobility, and whether it's Uber or Lyft, or GM Cruise or Ford Mobility to achieve their valuation, their potential, you need to transform the entire transportation network, the entire surface transportation network. That's how then you realize the opportunity for freight and logistics and improved productivity and greater GDP. And, and so here's a, an area that, um, that, that we talk about a lot, which is the fact that local governments own 76% of the roadways. Um, and I was here in the, um, in the conference yesterday, um, and, and this was an area that, that really wasn't discussed. Um, and, um, and, and so New York City is a local government, our largest local government in the United States. Um, but, but it's really the local governments that are, are doing a lot of work in this area, um, and we need to find ways to collaborate. Um, and then the challenge, so what's the challenge? Is there's 90,000 local governments in the US, right? So, so yes, we would like to go to D.C. and talk to Congress. Maybe some of us mistakenly go to the U.N. and look for a U.N. resolution. But in fact, there's 90,000 local governments, independently elected sovereign entities, um, that have the ability to tax, and they make the decisions about their roadways. Um, so that is, a, is, is an area where, even though we have the market pull, we need to have better coordination and communication. And then when we recognize how we've inherited this 90,000 local governments um, managing 76% of our roadways, 
then we can kind of understand the issues with the regulations. I mean, we know that um, at the federal level, there's the Vehicle Safety Act. And so, so we want that to be changed, we want that to be updated. That helped to provide the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. Um, and so all um, OEMs and all technology are, um, are all tier one are supposed to provide um, um, uh, and certify, they, want, they need to certify that all their products um, um, comply with applicable Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. So do we have any standards for automated vehicles? We actually have none, there's none. And even for connected vehicles, we don't have any. Um, and so, so the, the Vehicle Safety Act also created NHTSA, and so if we ask NHTSA to certify that any of these uh, manufacturers um, comply, um, they have nothing to comply with. They have no standard um, that's set. Um, and, then, and then, you know, this is a, a, an act that was um, created 50 years ago never contemplated computer drivers. And, and so we are looking then to the states and we see what California has done and Arizona through executive order and see, well, maybe that's a path. But the thing is, is that states are responsible for licensing drivers and motor vehicles and enacting and enforcing traffic laws and regulations. So, so you have the federal standard that's looking at safety and that the vehicle um, complies with, with standards. And then because we have a, a democracy and uh, 50 individual states with 50 separate constitutions, we leave it up to them to define the age of a driver, right? Some states have 16, 17, all those things vary. We, we leave it up to the states to define um, um, a learning permit and all these types of things. And so, so to ask a state to then, um, to then license um, a, uh, 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 an automated vehicle, right? That is, is actually a very, it, it's really not the role of DMVs, uh, Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, it's not the role of, of state government. Um, and it's a massive challenge. Um, so so if, if we have the local governments um, that are um, managing 76% of the roadways, and then we have state governments that are really unable to understand how to, um, how to register these vehicles, we really have this massive roadblock, right? This massive roadblock, and I think that that's really what's, what, what, what we need to address in a very targeted way, um, and that's the lack of progress in this area, the lack of real-world deployments. And so, and so then the, the last thing is we then actually, unfortunately, have seen accidents and deaths in this area. Um, and so, so this is an area where elected officials and decision makers are totally aware of, of the challenges in this space. Um, and, uh, and whether we say level five is, is where an uh, automated vehicle can operate in the same way as a human, um, whatever definitions we use, uh, the challenge is, is that from a technology perspective, um, there's many obstacles to overcome. And this idea of disruption, right, we're just gonna figure it out on the fly, move fast and break things, really doesn't work in this space. So if we have these challenges, is there a way forward? Can we actually make some tangible progress in this area? And, and we think we have some ideas um, on how to do that. And uh, there's really four principles. That, that we would like to share with you and see if it resonates. The first is private roads. So why do private roads have value, right? Um, a private road um, is, is a campus road, um, is a parking lot, um, is anything um, that, is, that is built and owned um, by a, a, a university, a government, um, and a private road is exempt from federal, state, and local law. Um, so imagine the network that's available in private roads. It's actually pretty extensive. And then if we combine that with slow speeds, um, and there are many uh, slow speed automated vehicle shuttles um, for 25 miles an hour or less, then we can begin to think about um, real use cases um, and real opportunities. And we heard about some of those ideas uh, yesterday. Um, the idea of having um, automated vehicles 
service feeders to transportation, to public transportation. Um, the, the idea that at slow speeds, these things are mature. Um, and, uh, and so if we look at automatic cruise control, where there's been some serious accidents and in fact some deaths with Tesla, the, the algorithm is written to ignore stationary objects. Well, at high speeds, that's catastrophic, right? But at slow speeds, with actual perception algorithm fully in place, the vehicle stops, right? It recognizes the person and stops. Um, and so why not focus on slow speeds? Uh, and then these other two things are, are something that I know this audience really cares about, which is um, recording data. And so when we work with these private companies, and that's part of the industry, university, government collaboration, um, they're going to use our roadways. They're going to use the 4 million miles of roadway. They're going to use our private roads. Why not ask for them to share the data, right? Um, and, and we're talking about the raw data. And so, unfortunately, as you know, that doesn't occur right now. Of the 50,000 miles that Waymo has, has driven, um, plus the billions of miles of simulation with Carcraft, none of those, no one has access to that data. Um, and that's really um, difficult um, if we want to make progress in this area. And then the last piece is to use that data um, to support integrated simulation. And so when we have that data, and, and when we understand it, then we can really understand the use cases, or we talk about uh, the operational um, design domain, and that really um, is, uh, is, is important if we're going to make progress. So, I know my uh, time is running out, and uh, I only have 15 minutes to convince you. Luckily, I moved the slide up. So, who's done it? We did it. So, applying these principles, which we affectionately call the Buffalo Principles, of private roads, slow speeds, record data, and integrated simulation, we um, won uh, a grant, we purchased, um, it happened, and again, this is technology agnostic, but we ended up deciding to partner with Local Motors, which uh, produces the Alley. This is a 3D printed, all electric, um, self-driving shuttle bus. Um, it, you know, it, it, can, it has no steering wheel, so it can't get registered with the DMV. Um, it was designed to be, to be um, driverless. Um, and, um, and they put in a manual way so it can, there can be an override. But it operates on its own, completely on its own. Um, you know, and and so, so the reason why we're the first in New York State is because we identified this blue road, that's a private road. So for anyone who has been in, um, in Buffalo or, or anyone who's been on a large university campus, there are many private roads and parking lots that are exempt from federal, state, and local law. And the reason why we partnered with Local Motors is because it's an open system and we are collecting all of the raw data from the vehicle. And we believe we're one of the first universities to do that in the nation. So I'll just leave with you with a question, who has ridden in an automated self-driving um, vehicle? Okay, great. For those of you who haven't, come to Buffalo. Right? <laughs> and so who has actually analyzed automated vehicle data? LIDAR data, right, um, radar data. So we have two people, right? Who wants to analyze automated vehicle raw data? Come to Buffalo, we can, you know, we can set it up. Actually, we could maybe even do it virtually with this thing called the internet. I, I heard about it, it might work. Um, uh, and then the last thing, who was actually built from the ground up automated vehicle operating systems, right? How are we gonna learn? How are we gonna have our students be those data scientists that BMW wants, unless we can actually, through trial and error, work with that data and understand that data? Well, we can do it all at, at a little place called University of Buffalo, and happy to talk with all of you and, and welcome the opportunity to build the dialogue, and that's really what this um, platform and, and this event is about. Uh, and I know my time is up, so thank you very much, and I look forward to talking to you. Yeah, that's fine. We can do that. Yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, our next presentation is by uh, Dr. Ben Pierce from HDR. And, uh, 
CAVs, right? So we've heard a lot of great ideas. <laughs> Sorry, a lot of great ideas already. Uh, and I want to add to that a, a little bit. And some of these you'll hear uh, are a little repetitive of what we've already heard. I always hear people talk about safety as a key driver of connected and automated vehicles. And you know, you see quotes like, we're going to get rid of all the, the traffic fatalities, we're going to get rid of all these accidents. Um, and it's, it's not just people in transportation that are saying these things. I mean, it's, it's politicians, it's, it's people you know, across the country. And, and this is a quote from you know, the, house, the House floor. Uh, Self-driving cars are projected to reduce traffic deaths by 90%. Okay, now, I'm, I'm a statistician by training and I'm a skeptic by birth. Um, so I, I wanted to, to take a look at that. So across the country, and we, we at HDR have started to take crash data for the past couple of years, analyze the root cause of those accidents, map them to one of the connected or autonomous vehicle technologies, like if it's a lane departure warning system, emergency electric brake lights, etc., and see when we roll all that up and we project it against those accidents, what the true rate really is. Now, here's the good news. I'll promise to stop doing that. That's not the good news. The good news is the crash reduction factors, when you look at historical accidents, if we assume that accidents in the future will look like accidents of the past, really will be quite a significant jump. It'll be a jump in the reduction of crashes that we haven't seen for decades, right? Now, here's the other thing we've learned. It will be highly dependent upon the level of adoption for autonomous and connected vehicles. Right? That kind of makes sense, right? The more adoption you have, the safer the roads will become. <coughs> and again, this is based on mapping actual, actual crashes. So if the crashes of tomorrow don't look like the crashes of yesterday, then this could all be a little fictitious, but the bottom line for us is what we learned when we mapped out the actual crashes is that you see anywhere, uh, you, get, you get 80 to 90, 70 to 90 percent reduction in crashes. It's about 10 to 20 percent below the adoption rate, right? So if we want to reduce crashes, we have to push the adoption. It's, it's pretty much that simple. All right, so that's setting the stage for the rest of this. Every day I see people doing unsafe things, myself included, right? But I see people texting and driving. Um, yesterday I saw somebody shaving and driving, <laughs> uh, which, which was impressive, but a little scary, right? And quite honestly, We've done decades of research on connected vehicles. And let's be honest, a lot of the technologies that will prevent crashes are connected vehicle technologies that kind of have been adopted by the autonomous vehicle world and, and called now autonomous vehicle uh, technology. So uh, forward collision warning um, in an autonomous vehicle is very similar to what emergency electronic brake lights were in the connected vehicle world, et cetera, et cetera. And we blew it. I don't think there's any other way to say it. We did decades of research on connected vehicles. We, we've looked at these accidents. We know it's going to save lives. And we did not get a rule published. We blew it. And it's across administrations, so it's not one administration versus the other. We just flat out blew it. 
Now, why is that important? Well, let's take a page out of the seatbelt experience. This is seatbelt uh, compliance in New York. And, that, and I'm happy to say that uh, as of 2017, compliance with seatbelt laws is around 93% in New York. That's fantastic. It took us 30 years to get there. <coughs> right, 30 years to get there. Now, how many of you believe that seatbelts don't save lives? That's what I thought. So, we know that seatbelts save lives, but it still <coughs> took us, as a community, 30 years to get to 90% adoption. And that's with legislation in 1984. Without that legislation, our adoption rate would have been much, much lower. And I can say that with confidence because, again, all of you can think back to your latest car ride, just look out the window, not while you're driving, but while you're a passenger, you'll see people doing unsafe things all the time. So without regulation, we've got trouble to push the adoption. Now some of the other market factors <coughs> that you, you heard about uh, will come to play, but if we're relying upon selling safety to the public, as the mechanism for connected and autonomous vehicle adoption, the history of seatbelt says we're going to have trouble. It's going to be 30 years before we see that adoption rate, unless we do something different. Okay, here's kind of a synopsis of what I just kind of went through. In the U.S., we're not a safety conscious culture. I wish we were, but we're not. People do unsafe things all the time, and we blew it. Um, as the last speaker pointed out, federal legislation on connected vehicles and automated vehicles has stalled out. Right in the latest NHTSA guidelines, 3.0, they pretty much said we're going to let the industry take take this, and we're not going to we're not going to regulate it. So I don't see a lot of hope for a lot of big regulations on automated vehicle. So we're not going to get that bump like we did with seatbelts. So it's not gonna get us on our way. And hopefully it doesn't take 30 years for, uh, adopt for adoption of autonomous and connected vehicles. There is a small glimmer of hope. Uh, recent surveys by the Auto Trader um, Car Technology Group have shown that 70% of people, when they called them and asked them, have, have said that they would rather have safety improvements safety features rather than information or entertainment features in their car. But I ask you to think back to your car, if you have one. Did you pay extra money for the safety features when you went in to look at that vehicle? Or did you pay extra money for the leather seats and the nice infotainment package, right? Now, if I ask you, Hey, would you pay extra money for safety? Of course, we're going to all say yes. We want everybody to be safe. But again, what we say about safety and what we do about safety are two different things. Okay, so what are we to do? Well, we know that if we had a killer app, or here I call it the adoption app, if we had something that made autonomous and connected vehicles sexy, made it uh, something that somebody couldn't live without, we'd get adoption. Right, so this is an eye chart of all of the connected vehicle <laughs> applications that US DOT and others have put together, right? And it's a great list and I love it. Right? Lots of great applications in there. Red light warning violation, there's eco traveler information, there's turn assist movement, blah, blah, blah. As a transportation professional, this list is very exciting and really thrilled to implement these things. As a member of the general public, none of these are the killer app. None of these are going to make me, as a general public, want to adopt connected and autonomous people. So one way that we're going to push the adoption is we have to find that application that situation that changes the paradigm to make the public want this as opposed to trying to convince them that they need it. 
Now, I'm not an expert in applications. I want to admit that right now. But when I started thinking about what would be some killer apps for me, especially in a city like New York, here's four of them that I, that I came up with. One, when we first started testing connected vehicle technologies back in the day, and the day was mid-90s, one of the use cases that we thought about was using this radio, new radio frequency for info, infotainment. Sort of like having Wi-Fi access everywhere, right? And we have that in airports and in some cities we have that, but there's no reason why we couldn't double up this radio um, and use it for infotainment purposes. It is, after all, either a super cellular radio, which we all stream movies and videos and things like that all the time, or it's a super Wi-Fi router, which we all download and look at movies and pictures and all that all the time. Um, smart parking. If I could be directed to a parking place, especially here in New York, I would love it. That might push me over the edge on, hey, I gotta have this technology if my car can help me park. If I didn't have to buy a separate toll tag, if I didn't have my easy pass, right, and my car just took care of that for me, it might be worth a little extra to me. And if I could update my vehicle over the air and not have to worry about it, right? As I'm driving along, I could download updates and it would just do it like my phone does. I don't have to worry about it, um, it just happens. I don't know if these are killer apps. I don't know if these are gonna um, make the difference, but these are some concepts. But I think it's on us as agencies, as responsible parties for the transportation network to think of, from a public perspective, what is it that they want that will make them start clamoring for this technology? So what else can we do as transportation agencies? Well, there's a couple things I think we can do to be ready to kind of promote the adoption um, as agencies, as municipalities in one of these 90,000 uh, municipalities. The first and foremost, I think it's important that we start including autonomous and connected vehicle thoughts in our everyday business. Every day we go out and we do planning studies, we do strategic planning, we look at the future, we think about what the system's gonna look like. And by and large, of those 90,000 municipalities, I would say roughly 75 to 85% of them are not including autonomous and connected vehicle in their planning process. And since we're planning for the future of 2030, 2045, 2050, right, it's not uncommon to see uh, a transportation strategic plan for 2050, that's a miss. Because I don't care if you think that we're gonna start to see adoption next year, five years, 10 years, or 20 years, sometime over the next couple of decades, and if we take the seatbelt example, the next 30 years, we'll see adoption of automated and connected vehicles. So if we're doing a strategic plan for 2050, we need to include autonomous and connected vehicles in that plan. And we need to do things like include it in our uh, travel demand simulation tools. This is a tool that um, was developed in Florida that FDOT is now using. It's a planning tool. Um, it helps adjust the demand according to social dynamics and as well as various adoption rates of automated and connected vehicles. I think this is a positive step. What else can we do? Well, we could include autonomous and connected vehicle technologies in our thoughts for everyday capacity estimation, right? If we're gonna, if we're gonna look at it on the demand side, we should look at it on the supply side. So if we're thinking about widening a, a road or we're thinking about adding a turn lane or whatnot, and we're gonna probably do some simulation studies and we're gonna look at at the capacity of that roadway, we should include autonomous and connected vehicles because they will have a difference and they will change capacity either through reduced headways or because they'll stay in the exact center of the road, which means we don't need 12 foot lanes. We might be able to get by with 10 foot lanes or eight foot lanes as our cars get smaller and smaller. Especially if we go to a shared mobility model in the future, we're not going to have a whole bunch of suburbans running around. Right? The cars are generally going to get smaller. 
which means we need less, and they're gonna stay exactly in the middle of the lane, which means we'll get capacity on our existing roadways just from restriping. We ought to start accommodating that and looking at that when we're doing uh, our build outs, our roadway construction, our reconstruction, our plans for the future. Because again, from the moment you start planning until the moment your first shovel hits the dirt, it's usually two to five years. And then you're expecting that roadway to have a service life of 30 to 50 years. <coughs> the other thing we can do is we can see how ready we are for autonomous and connected vehicles, right? I mean, let's not make this the wild, wild west. I know the automotive manufacturers, a lot of them have said, we don't need anything from the roadside. Well, that's just baloney, right? My 16-year-old driver tells me all the time, Dad, I don't need your help to drive, right? I don't need it. Of course, he tells his mom that too, but she gives him lots of advice from the best. And just like that, by the way, if you don't laugh at my jokes, it's gonna be a really long time. <laughs> That's the warning. So, just like that though, we know that autonomous vehicles use roadside infrastructure to navigate, right? Why do we talk about high definition mapping? Well, the reason we talk about high definition mapping is because that's how autonomous vehicles triangulate their position to stay in the middle of the lane. They go out and look for reference markers on the side of the road and triangulate. So then that begs the question, when an autonomous vehicle gets into an accident, and they will get in accidents, who's at fault? Is it the autonomous vehicle manufacturer? Or is it the municipality who didn't provide the right reference markers for that autonomous vehicle? We're gonna find out. And unfortunately, we're gonna find out in the court system. And I think in, in, in advance of that, it would behoove every municipality to go out and do an assessment of the readiness of their road network to accommodate autonomous vehicles. And then last, I think one of the things that we as transportation engineers do all the time is we take a look at the data and we say, you know what, we had X number of fatalities here, we've had Y number of crashes here, um, let's do you know, we go to the highway safety manual and we look up a countermeasure and we say, oh yeah, the rumble strip's here, or um, we're going to cut in speed grooves to reduce speed, or we're going to put a chevron for this sharp curve, or whatever the case may be. So now that we have a, a technique where we can go back and look at and look at historical crashes, we can map them to our root cause, and we can link that root cause to specific technologies in the vehicle and on the roadside, why shouldn't we incorporate that kind of methodology and put connected and automated vehicle technologies into the same kind of countermeasures list as we have with other roadside technologies? For example, if we picked a certain intersection here in the city and we looked at all the historical crashes, we might just find that that would be a good candidate, that intersection might be a good candidate for uh, a signal phase and timing application. If two or a stop gap exists, we have too many people running the road. If that's the case, then that's a countermeasure we can push for that intersection or that area of the city. So it's not a ubiquitous application of all connected and autonomous vehicle technologies. We can be specific. And I think we should start doing that, taking a look at our crashes so that we can prioritize <coughs> what we want to invest in so that we're ready as agencies or municipalities when the con connected and autonomous vehicles are adopted. That's it for me, thank you very much. So our uh, next presentation is by uh, Mr. Eric Richardson from the city of New York on uh, to a safer fleet we have a case of vehicles and other technologies. That's uh, welcome, Adam. Good morning, everybody. If I'm not talking too close to the mic, just let me know. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about New York City's fleet, talk to you about how we've transitioned to a safer fleet, and where connected vehicles are going to be playing a future role. So first of all, the city's fleet operates over 32,000 vehicles. 
most of which are in police, sanitation, fire, transportation, DEP, parks, and corrections. The rest of the fleet is about the other 10%. Um, we have one of the greenest fleets in the, in the country. About 10,000 vehicles run on alternative fuels. Um, and we've received numerous awards from federal, state, and locals about our fleet. Um, just want to talk a little bit about the risks to our fleet. The risks to our fleet are the same as anybody else's fleet in, in, in the country. Things like oversized vehicles, overweight vehicles, speeding, um, parking where the vehicle shouldn't be parked. So things that are you know, <coughs> happens to everybody every day happens to our fleet as well. So in the past, going back a few years, the way that the city did vehicle technology is it was on a contract by contract, agency by agency basis. So there was no universal program for safety. It was, it was done by every agency. Um, just similar to now, um, some manufacturers are starting to get away from it, but safety and frame were always tied. Um, so if you wanted the automatic braking, you had to buy the leather seats. If you wanted the forward collision warning systems, you had to buy the information centers. And we are working with manufacturers now to separate those. Um, implementation of systems were always based on market availability. Um, so basically agencies would go out and then say, well, what can we get? And that's what we're going to spec, as opposed to trying to push the market for, for better and more improved technologies. Um, and they weren't done with citywide statistics on causality or any other reason. So agencies were inspecting vehicles in a vacuum, um, but also they were inspecting vehicles um, based on thoughts rather than based on data. So one of the first things that we did um, four years ago was we put in a citywide collision tracking system. So all agencies report into the one system of every single collision, causality, the weather conditions, the road conditions, the time and date of the event. So we are now able to do statistics based on what occurred. And as you can see, um, in fiscal year 18, 171 of our collisions were rear ends, which was the most of all the ones that resulted in injury. So obviously, we focused on that. The other thing that we did was we started a defensive driving program for all city drivers. Um, and as part of that program, we surveyed our drivers on what safety features they believed they needed in the vehicles in order to make them safer. I mean, as you can see, backup cameras were by far the highest. And this was done about three years ago. This 19,000 number is close to 35,000 now. Um, interestingly enough, there are things that are now coming in that are a little bit different than what we originally saw. Um, we did some case studies. So we did case studies on backup cameras. And while backup cameras are now mandated in all light duty vehicles, they are not mandated in both class two. Um, and we actually mandated them in our vehicles a year before the federal regulation. We actually do that, um, mandate backup cameras or other backup systems in all city vehicles now. Um, we have case studies on automatic braking. As some of you know, um, different manufacturers have different things that they call automatic braking. So we did a lot of case studies on what does it mean, um, is it more pedestrian or vehicle associated, and also how do the different technologies work. Um, we did a preliminary implementation of passive telematics. Because what we wanted to see is, does the system work? Does it affect how our drivers drive? Um, and what we did was we did it over the city's Dicewood system as opposed to cellular. Um, and we have a lot of passive data where the, it was collected onto the system, but now transmitted and we would have to go and get it later. Um, and we did a preliminary implementation on 200 vehicles for truck sidewalks. Um, that's to prevent people from sliding under a truck in case of a collision. In May of 2017, we put out a safely transition plan. On the left-hand side here um, is all the requirements that we now spec out in our vehicles, um, including automatic braking for light duty vehicles, automatic headlights, side guards, <coughs> and smart backup alarms. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, the first year, um, we had connected vehicle technologies <coughs> in our May other technologies column. Um, we are now going to be um, suggesting that as a best practice starting next month. So our current state. So we have over 1,700 vehicles now with truck side guards. Um, when we first started out this program, it was one manufacturer and one style. 
Um, we now have six manufacturers that we can um, procure truck side guards from, so we can do pretty much any type, any style vehicle. Um, we track all of the fleet technologies that we have on our vehicles. So as you can see, we now have 1,500 um, vehicles that have different technologies on them, anywhere from surround cameras to back cameras, blind spots, driver alerts, things of that nature. We have live telematics on our vehicles. Um, we are now installing, um, that's going to be hopefully done the rest of this calendar year. Um, we're excited about live telematics, not only for being able to track speed and be able to track location, being able to track proximity, but also being able to look at things such as road conditions, average road speed, and hazardous areas where there's a lot of hard braking and hard acceleration to be able to help city DOT um, look at those roads to see what they can do to make them safe. We now get live collision alerts. So whenever there's a city vehicle that's in a collision, we know as soon as it happens, we know where are the vehicles that happens, we know what speed the vehicle was going, and we get a map. Um, we're actually now able to communicate directly with the drivers as soon as something happens. We have a fleet office of real-time tracking, so all this live telematics data that we are collecting goes into the boards in our fleet office of real-time tracking. Um, that, that is staffed pretty much from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. seven days a week. So where are we going? So one of the first things that we are going to be announcing in November, um, this is a little bit of a preview, um, is we are going to be specking high vision truck cabs into all of our vehicles. Um, we believe that even with all the safety technologies out there, the human interaction between driver and pedestrian is actually the most important, and being able to see um, further um, to the street, further to the sidewalk, is very important. Um, direct vision standard actually is mandated in London, um, starting this year. We're going to be doing virtual reality training. So being able to take a driver and put them in a virtual environment within the city. We actually are mapping out the entire city grid. So we are going to be able to put somebody in a, car, in a vehicle, in a virtual reality simulator, as if they're driving New York City streets. We're going to be implementing vehicle camera systems in all of our vehicles. Um, one of the things that we found is it's not only um, was used to, it's typically used to mitigate liability and claims, but we want to use our, our camera systems to also help train um, and also be able to understand driver behavior. <coughs> We're looking into a similar system that they've now mandated in Europe, which is integrated 911 alerts. So if a vehicle gets into a serious collision, the vehicle will automatically transfer to 911 and or call centers the information about that vehicle, where the collision is, and what the condition is. Now this is where we, we're, we're really going to what we're talking about here today. So we are going to be participating in the federal and the city DOT project. Um, up to 5,000 city vehicles will be installed. Um, you know, we are looking at the safety um, features, such as our crash warnings, blind spot, and lane change warnings. We are also looking at the promising aspects of things that we don't necessarily get with our live telematics, which are speed compliance, work zones, pedestrians, and crosswalks, and oversight vehicle compliance. One of the other things that we are looking forward to with the connected vehicle technologies is to be able to integrate with our live telematics and other vehicle safety technologies to see if we get a forward collision alert warning through the connected vehicle system and if the vehicle's automatic brake system and engages. And then I just wanted to let everybody know that on November 28th, we're going to be having our street safety forum, Queens Dinner in the Park. Um, it's open to all. It's from 8.30 to 1.30 p.m. Breakfast and lunch will be served. Um, we are going to have representatives from City DOT, Transcore, <coughs> IKS America, and other companies, as well as two victims of distracted driving events in order to be able to talk about <coughs> Um, safety features. That's all I have. Thank you. All right, so the last presentation of this session is by Professor uh, uh, DA. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, I'll try it. I'll, uh, I'll be wrong, Lou. Okay, and uh, her presentation will be on uh, deployment planning for. Uh, fraction, fractionally owned autonomous vehicles. Let's welcome uh, Fadia.
Hi everyone, I'm Matia Aguilar, I'm assistant professor at the City College of New York. Hi. Oh, my. Hello. I'm Matthew, I love Viralu. So I'm assistant professor at the City College of New York. And uh, today I will talk about uh, deployment planning for fractional mold on campus vehicles. So this talk is a little bit different from what people uh, from academia and research is mostly focused on travel behavior and patients' research and a little bit of background in computer science. So it's going to be a little bit different from the talks that we presented. I hope you enjoy it. I will say it's the recent work that I work with Dr. John Cho from NYU. So, oh. so once we are talking about urban settings and driven, like cities of New York, like New York, one of the factors that are important uh, for me, especially when I travel behavior, are people. So how does any change that we are making in the network and um, any planning or these autonomous vehicles, how they're going to change the behavior of the people? And can these people work together or can we have a kind of collaborative consumption model for using autonomous vehicles? What kind of advantages this model is going to provide us? We know that autonomous vehicles come to flexibility um, in the time because they can move on and they don't need to be a combat way driver, they don't need a driver. Another thing is that as we move forward, we become more open to share our data and to share our space. Yesterday there was a talk here, the keynote speaker was talking about the fact that um, we own our vehicle, we love our vehicles, our vehicles are whatever we have. But in New York, coming from, I, I did my PhD in California, I read it, that concept over there, but in New York we love to share. And let's see that how does this model can work, and we're going to present some mathematical framework for this, and then talk about the main idea of the platform. So what happens here in the nation? What we have, okay, households have multiple vehicles. Like some households, as uh, the speakers are, 1.79 is the vehicle ownership of household in the United uh, States. So the more vehicles people have, the higher congestion. And most of the time. These vehicles are not being used 90% of the time they are parked in a parking garage. And then as we see here, these large number of the people as we have, for every household we have vehicles. It creates higher road congestion, it creates large percentage of idle and parked vehicles, and also it has a higher cost and <coughs> usage ratio. So, but how can we own share of vehicles in different fleets of vehicles? What do you guys think about that? Would you like to have, instead of having owning one vehicle, having shares of different vehicles and see that uh, how it impact? The idea came from the stock market. How many of us have stock markets? I myself have it and I lost a lot of money last week. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, what, what does it offer to us, really? Playing like in Robin, what does it offer to us? We choose what the stock we want. We have different shares, we have some credits, we go and we buy different shares of different companies, and anytime you want, we sell this, yes? Now suppose you have this idea with your vehicles. <coughs> Instead of owning one vehicle, I can have shares of Ford, I can have shares of Porsche, and as a professor, it's a lot of attractive for me because I cannot afford to drive a Porsche. Or different vehicles. Suppose that you go online and reserve different types of these vehicles, you have some credits, you pay them, and we own these vehicles, and we based on our behavior, based on our demand, you see that which vehicles we can use, and then um, this is the shares that we have reserved for them. So if you want to design this system, as a, either you are a fleet designer or you really want to design a platform, what problems do you might have here? Any idea? What, what things, what aspects you should look for these problems? Availability. Huh? Availability. Scalability? Uh, availability. Availability, exactly. Okay. So what does availability is going to cause here? Like suppose there are like a fleet manager, like as a, if we talking about as a user, I'm trying to, huh? How do you get the car to you? Um, that's autonomous vehicle, so you can make a reservation. That's what we are looking on the autonomous vehicle because it drives on its own. <laughs> what else? 
Can you satisfy demand during the peaks? Exactly. So it comes to fill size and problem, yes? And not that during the peaks also, because we cannot invest and have a lot of vehicles also. But what does the demand is going to change? The more people are going to use the system, the demand is going to be higher, we might have more vehicles. But at the times that the vehicles are not going to be used also, it's a dynamic thing. Because people are going to trade, we have now different players. Not players, the agency who decides about the vehicles they're going to buy, what kind of vehicles they're going to have. And another is the users. For example, I, have, uh, I can sell my share also. I have the, uh, for example, a year before, I made a reservation for one specific vehicle at this time, and I suppose it's a very fancy vehicle, but then I decided, okay, there is a demand for the vehicle, someone wants to pay more, and I want to sell it. So it's a very dynamic uh, thing. It's a little bit of, um, maybe not realistic right now, but I think that uh, it might become a very interesting problem to solve. So in this problem, if we have here, we can meet the larger demand, uh, with a smaller number of the vehicles, but we need to know the problem is here. Sorry for the uh, quality, but here it looks much better. But here it's a little bit. We need to know which people, the households, are going to match together, how this dynamic is going to work, and at the end, as a fleet designer, how many vehicles do I need from each type of these vehicles? So let's see. So today I'll talk about shared vehicle ownership problems. So critical questions. How many vehicles do I need? For example, I'm a BMW, I mean, decision maker. I want to know that uh, how many vehicles and what kind of models and uh, types of the vehicles we have. Where these vehicles should be? Because uh, we want to minimize the total travel time. Are they gonna be, how this is gonna be distributed across New York City, five boroughs of New York City? Where am I going to put different parts of these vehicles? And when they should be where? And what price? The price is important because we have different players, multiple number of the users and muscles are playing with the price. So the price is going to be dynamic. And how to match people? What are the preferences of the people to be matched by each other and by different vehicles? That's another thing. Yesterday, the speaker was talking about the fact that, for example, I may not want to share my vehicle with a person who's a smoker. Or I may not want to share my vehicle with a person uh, who might have a bigger household. So these things might impact um, the usage and the, the preferences of the people also. <coughs> and what are the impacts of demand? Are they going to increase the rise because it's going to be more accessible? Or are they going to change people's schedule? Like I might go to work at different time, but when I see I can have a higher offer for that vehicle in the peak morning, I might say, okay, I'm going to work a little bit later, but I'm going to make $100 more. So these are um, interesting aspects of this problem that can be addressed. So in order to address this, in this, it's the recent work paper, hopefully it's going to be published uh, soon. Uh, we we finish our second round reviews. Uh, in this paper, in this work, we are trying to understand what is the optimal fleet size from the organizer's point of view? How is it going to impact the behavior of the users more realistically? And at the end, uh, what is the optimal uh, riding is scheduling? Because as I told, fleet designer not only needs to know how many vehicles they need, but these autonomous vehicles should be told where they should be, at what time, who they should gonna serve, and how they're going to behave. So these are all mathematical problems that we need to solve. So let's look at this one. This is a simplified version of the model. I have three households. I have M and vehicles. And each of these households have made some reservations of the times that we have here of different vehicles. So my, oh sorry, okay. My goal is to see that how this system is gonna work. This, um, this is a very um, more non uh, structure of here. If you look at the people's behavior, these solid lines shows that what people are doing, where people are at different times of the day. As we see here, each of us have these chains of activities. For example, at A2, today I'm here from a, uh, 9, I came here at 9, and I'm going to be here in two hour day. So my schedule is locked here, and the afternoon I'm going to go some other places. So this matching problem, this way, because I'm going to match my trips together. So I need to know this, uh, the, autonomous vehicle that I need to know, the fleet that I need to design, should match these trips together, means that where they should go and which people are going to be matched. So it's a pretty complex optimization problem. 
If you have a simplified network, here we have, these are different nodes of the network. Each node has some time windows constraint, means that people need to be at different parts of the city at different times of the day. So if you have more people, suppose it's the autonomous vehicle, it's going to come and pick up this person, which is in yellow, and which is in green, and drop them at this location. Another service is going to happen. Again, drop the second person from the same household and go and save another household, which is we show the origin and destination of this tree with the red dots, and at the end, it's going to end the service. So this is the entire model, and the more, the bigger the city that we have, the uh, complex the problem is going to be. So it's a complex become a very, very problem with time windows. Um, and more important, uh, important players that we have here, as I told before, we have users. My users are the households who are using the system who are going to make reservation, who are going to choose the vehicles they want to be, who are going to choose the type of the people that they want to share their time with, that their vehicles with. Is, I'm not talking about the shared drive. I'm talking about shared vehicles. I will have my vehicle at the time that I'm using only serving me. It's not going to serve another person or another household member of the other person. And also another important thing is the car companies. They need to know how many vehicles, as I talked before, where, at what time, and what kind of ridings they're going to have. And also, we need to design this trading platform that at the end is stable, equilibrium, because we need to find the equilibrium demand for the people, the pe pe people's behavior is going to equilibrate, and also we need to convert to some solution which matches these two partners here. So, the question is, is that how this system is going to operate? What are the practical issues? Is it viable or not? And uh, I mean, the practicality, like if the system is going to operate properly enough that pre uh, presents a good level of service for the users and satisfies everyone. How would it impact mobility behavior? As I told before, it can shift the demand uh, for transportation. If I see there is a high demand for a specific vehicle in the morning that I can trade my time and gain some money because I reserved that way long before, that can change my demand for transportation. Either I can cancel my trip, I can use another trip, I can use transit, or I can reschedule it and make a reservation for a cheaper vehicle. What are the criteria for people to, trade, to choose their vehicles? As I told before, do I have taste preference among the users? That I don't want to share my vehicle with the specific kinds of the users? Or do I need to have like the color of the vehicle or the size of the vehicle? Any preferences that need to be considered here. The pricing mechanism. What kind of pricing mechanism we are going to have? Like these are important from the pricing from the uh, market size. And it's going to impact the problem. And how long before people can reserve the system and how long before they can sell the times that they have scheduled? And would this system be sustainable? I mean, can it answer and address all the transportation or um, mobility issues that we have in the system? And is there a realistic market for this? I mean, are people are going to use it or not? I we think they're going to use it. I think I might use it. I myself could use it and uh, because it gives me flexibility. It gives me a large pool of vehicles that they can choose from. And it's also an interesting market to trade your time. And instead of um, fixating me to owning one vehicle 100% of the time, it gives me a lot of choices. So I will not talk about the details of the model, just giving a picture. So we have, we defined it by level optimization model. In the higher level, the agency or the car owner uh, company uh, finds the optimum fleet size and dispatches them where to go. And the lower level that we have here, user like me who wants to say, I need to adjust my trips a little bit so I can accommodate or um, reserve and trade the system with my time with other people. So, and also the important factor here, the mechanism that we set this slide price, this slide pricing for the users here. So as we talked before, they're from the, uh, from the decision makers point of view or from the car companies, they uh, do fleet sizing and riding and then fleet scheduling. And at the end, the users also then decide that where to go and what kind of activities they're going to do. So we designed this uh, algorithm and we tested on two different uh, sample examples. The small case study, uh, the solution is based on when there's the composition, some optimization algorithm that we do. For example, we have the schedule of the people for uh, four households that we have here. These nodes show that where they're going to be, at what time they're going to be, and then we want to design a fleet that serves all the, uh, all the 
um, deep, uh, all the demand for the region. This one, for example, shows that, okay, with three vehicles, we can address all the demand raised by these four household members that they have without, uh, making, without making them to delay or reschedule. And of course, it depends on the pricing mechanism. These case studies are to show that what are the basic concepts of them, how the algorithms are going to work, what solution, efficient techniques that we, we need to provide for them. And this one shows that after they adjust, they can adjust their patterns, these users. And this one, uh, similar to the uh, like stock pricing that we have here, as we see here, we, uh, this model generates us the value uh, or the willingness to pay or the reservation cost for different for one week of the vehicles that we have here at different times of the day, like how much people are willing to pay the price value, similar to the one that we have at the stock markets. And also we. Uh, Maybe uh, run this model for New York City data to see the top efficient algorithms are. And also similarly, uh, the results shows that uh, what are the reservation costs for different times of the day through the system. So the developed models, uh, algorithm, mathematically it works, computationally it is efficient. But definitely this is a, a study and this is a new approach and we are thinking that similarly that like Uber and Lyft, the ride sharing company, we can have companies like car club companies that, uh, like car clubs that they can uh, they can serve multiple users at the same time. So this uh, in this talk, uh, what we talk about is that uh, this is the opportunity for fractional ownership of different kinds of vehicles. So idea like car clubs, it is a smaller fleet size to address the demand for region. Of course, it's better than owning uh, each household more than one vehicle. Pricing mechanism and its impacts on demand management needs to be studied and it really impacts the results of the model because um, depending on what kind of mechanism do we have, what are the priorities are given, or what is the fleet size that we have, the price is going to go up. And uh, impacts on urban forms in long term because as we talked before, it can create some adjustments in the behavior of the people, so it can change the spatial distribution over the region. And also, we need to know that what the user preferences are. Uh, I mean, demand elasticity, how people are sensitive to the prices, the users that we have in the market, what is the reservation and trading behavior of the people in the system, and also, are people, how much they're going to be willing to pay for each time to make reservation, and how they're going to reschedule or uh, cancel or uh, change their itinerary that they had in mind from the beginning. And by this slide, ending my talk and thank you so much. Uh, for questions can I ask? Okay, if you have any questions I would love to answer. Yes? You can touch on the liability issue. How do you tend to ensure this program? Um, minimize, uh, minimize your, your liability on the insurance side. Uh, we didn't look at that part. We just looked at the from kind of an operational like modeling part of it. Uh, we didn't go into the legal or those insurance uh, factors because these are part of the, the for example, if a company, the, the problem is like how many vehicles they're going to need. Uh, but then law and legal problems or insurance problems are totally separate aspects, so we didn't touch on that. Yes? Do you see that thing right now? Although they're not the vehicles, how do, do you, do you, have you compared their model with your model? No, I haven't. Uh, are these, which company is that? Toyota. Toyota, Toyota yeah, but then uh, the thing is that um, this is um, mostly like academic formulations of the model, and like they're not gonna. Um, they're not, they don't present that how they are deciding how it's a fleet size or also a stock marketing part that they don't have these kind of things that if you make the reservation you can train and save your timing also with other people. So that's totally different aspects. But we would love to share our ideas with those companies if there is a representative here so we can see that how would it change. Yeah. Yes? Uh, Larry Burns, uh, did you do research for GM, well, came to Columbia about four years ago, he a paper basically did a farm. Really, the fleet sizes that would be needed for a fully shared system mm -hmm. in New York. They identified that all existing trips today could be actually handled at only 25% of the current exit vehicles. And you look at that in Grand Rapids, and you look at the people community that have more endurance. 
city. Um, and so the conclusion of that is that moving beyond individual ownership will be able to do fractional ownerships with the large shared systems provided by all those services. Yes, see, um, you really can depopulate or deoccupy the city quite significantly, easily losing up to two thirds of the vehicles. Um, exactly, like the analysis that I skipped a little bit because uh, also there is no sphere for the entire uh, that Manhattan, Washington Heights area. There's around like 2,000, uh, around 3,000 vehicles, uh, 3,000 trips that are addressed with two different methods that we have, like 50 and 40 uh, fleet that can address all the all the needs of the run daily of the entire trips that people are going to make that day. And this data is from travel survey, exactly. It can have a huge impact. That's what we're talking about. What are going to be impacts on demand? And um, because it totally is going to change the scheduling, the behavior, the mobility, it's based on distribution of the vehicles and the demand. So in the long term, it can really change urban settings. What? When it is being uh, applied, when it is being used, like the companies, if, for example, if we have these uh, companies who are this uh, active in this, and people are using it, so after it's being adjusted, we're going to see some results. It depends on long term in terms of urban planning, of course, it's going to take way longer, but it depends on uh, people's mobility behavior. Even now with Uber and Lyft that they have been used for the last three years more often, we see more traffic in the streets. Like that. Some of the waves are coming after five or six years, but some of them are going to take longer, maybe 20 years, to see the impacts of the cities.